Hi everyone, I'm your guest host for the day, Pierre Asselin. Uh, welcome to, to this edition of, of Global Connections. Um, we'll be addressing uh, today um, um, uh, an issue that's, that's, that's been um, actually quite, quite significant in terms of its impact on, on, on the global community, and that's, and that's, and that's human trafficking, uh, specifically the trafficking of, of, of girls and, and, and women in, in Southeast Asia. And, and we've got a, a, a wonderful guest today, um, uh, the host of, 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 of Global Connections, Professor Grace Cheng from Hawaii Pacific University. Hi, how well, are you, Pierre? I'm, I'm quite well, Grace. Welcome, welcome to my show. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's great to have you here. Uh, uh, Grace, can you, I, I think, I think your, your millions of viewers and fans worldwide are aware of what you do and who you are, but could you tell us a little more about, about yourself and, 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 and what you do and your, your research interests, among others, beyond, beyond human trafficking? Well, I'm uh, an associate professor of political science at Hawaii Pacific University, and my background is in comparative politics. Um, my original area of focus is in Southeast Asia and China, and um, you know, comparative politics is a study of different types of political systems, but I'm also interested in different political thought and uh, different political uh, approaches to issues international uh, of, of international significance, such as coordinating on uh, migration issues and, and, and other other types of issues. So, um, you know, I've I've studied different areas of comparative politics, uh, and I've been in the you know in the academia for about 20 years. Uh, and so, in the last about five years, uh, I've been working with an organization that's based in Bangkok, and it's uh, it's called the uh, International Institute for Peace and Development Studies. And it, pr it develops a number of different programs for um, for academics, but also for people who work in non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations, as, as well as governmental agencies, um, to work on all sorts of different issues regarding um, peace building and and post-conflict transitions, as well as development issues. And you know, human trafficking is deeply tied to to some of the challenges of development because that's you know some of the reasons why there are people who are vulnerable to to be yeah. victimized by trafficking I, w I, so I was looking up your profile online and you've you've you've, you've got a book on nationalism and human rights is that is that correct is that, mm -hmm. that kind of where your part of your interest came from or 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 actually um, my background in, in migration itself goes back to when I was an undergraduate um, I was a, a, an intern with the internet what's now called the International Organization for Migration um, working in the field office in the uh, Philippines there was a field office where there used to be a, a Vietnamese refugee camp or where you know uh, people, oh, the whole people the, the whole people, yeah, okay, okay. yeah in, the, in the late 80s oh, wow. so uh, there were it was called the Philippine first asylum camp so uh, from there this was an intern that I got through where I went to undergrad, Georgetown University. At the time, uh, the center was called the Center for Immigration Policy and Refugee Assistance. So I've been interested in migration issues since then. I and mean, we still have a lot of refugee issues, as we see a lot in the U.S. news, as well as yeah. international, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, so, you know, actually, that's also kind of interesting um, as far as coordinating uh, the challenges uh, of migration, because sometimes migration is stemmed from from either a natural disaster or conflict, you know, people fleeing situations in order to survive. Um, and trafficking is also a migration issue. Sometimes they overlap, as we see in, in where I was this past winter in Thailand. Um, a lot, some of the issues are pr more clear cut, what we classically consider trafficking. Uh, but sometimes they do overlap with people trying to, to flee a conflict zone or, or a zone where there's heightened insecurity yeah. on their physical well-being, um, specifically Myanmar, yeah. uh, the Rakhine state. I, th I think I can't help but think that this is one of the reasons why a lot of Americans kind of fail to understand uh, uh, some, 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 some of these problems that have to do with refugees because there's, there's a very limited understanding of the kinds of circumstances that will prompt people to end up leaving their, their 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 home countries. I mean, I mean, there's war, but there's also a variety of other of other instances or or, or, or sets of circumstances that will prompt people to to, to leave. And and with mm -hmm. respect to Vietnam, we did have the war, but eventually economics also kind of became a, a major 
factor mm -hmm, in, in mm -hmm. prompting people to leave. As well as, po you know, in, in post, uh, in the, what Americans call the Vietnam War, after the war concluded in, in 75, there was also political, you know, the very turbulent political uh, revolutionary transition yeah. and that, that and the economic uh, disruption of that. So yeah, that, that causes a lot of upheaval in the societies, um, making, you know, the situation, especially their near as well as longer term future, um, look very uncertain. And, and that, that causes people to, to, to think about options for survival. And sometimes it's immediate because they're the direct victims of persecution or members of their, yeah. of their community are. So yeah, there's a myriad of reasons uh, that, that people do um, decide to leave their home country. And, you know, having, having been exposed to different, you know, groups of these communities, um, you know, usually people don't want to leave their home country. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Always sort of, it's, a, it's, yeah. A, it's a hardship. It's not a, a simple decision. So, so uh, yeah, looking at your bio, you, you, you've been to Iran, and, and I, that would be, I think, very interesting <laughs> to, to explore. And if I don't screw up too badly today, maybe I can there come many, back. There are many and, and, refugees and, and, from <laughs> Afghanistan that I met in Iran, but that's but, another subject. But, but, uh, so most recently, you were in Thailand, mm -hmm. uh, as you suggested earlier, uh, and, and you, you were kind of, you know, part of an, 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 an effort to kind of to study and, 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 and work with uh, 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 refugees in, in, in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, and in, in neighboring Burma. Um, can you give us a sense of, of what the situation is like, of, of, of what, uh, I guess, the kind of the, the, the latest developments are with respect to this, this, this issue of trafficking of, of women and girls mm -hmm. in, 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 in that particular area? Yeah, so, so yeah, my, my time was spent in Bangkok um, and speaking with, going and visiting and speaking with various different organizations, non-governmental as well as governmental and international organizations. Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, Thailand is, is one of the places where a lot of migrants uh, have arrived for a variety of reasons. Um, some of their neighboring countries, in particular Laos and Cambodia, uh, the, the economies are not as flourishing as it is in Thailand, yeah. which f for the region is doing relatively well. So people, you know, coming to, th to Thailand from those countries seeking opportunities for their economic livelihood, um, often sending money back home to support their families. And so, you know, a lot of this is, is legal and um, there's, there's uh, you know, besides traveling with your passport, uh, within, within Southeast Asia you get these pink cards that allow you to travel travel you know, and work in another country within the, uh, within the Southeast Asian region. Um, so there are those people, but then there are also people who are uh, there, uh, what we call irregular migrants, and you know, they're not there with the proper documentation. And part of that you know, is, again, th you know, these kinds of push what we call push factors, like in their home countries, there are such limited opportunities, mm -hmm. their families are really struggling, and so they are trying to find a way and they are often, you know, um, you know, somehow convinced that there are some very good opportunities for them to provide some income for supporting themselves and their family. And, and you know, for this particular issue, uh, why, you know, there's significant, there's more, a little bit more concern f uh, on women and girls is because, you know, trafficking is where this, this uh, you know, employment of, of peop persons, uh, through coercion and, and force and threats uh, happens. And it can happen to either gender, p either men, women, boys and girls. But you know, women and girls actually, ha there are a few more reasons why there are more, uh, they are more mo vulnerable. Um. Be before we get into that, let me ask you, so, so is this a case of basically Thai entrepreneur, if we want to kind of going into Burma and neighboring Burma, Cambodia, Laos, recruiting people to put them to work let's say in the sex industry in Thailand, or is, it, is, it mu is the picture much more complicated than that in terms of the trafficking itself? It's pretty complicated. I mean, trafficking everywhere, it's not, um, it's, it's not uh, the, the sole domain of, of people from one country or other. Mm -hmm. So as far as the destination country, it's not necessarily that the, 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 the whole trafficking circuit, I guess the network, right? There are yeah. many stages of it. There's the recruitment in the hometown. There's the, you know, um, there's the people who, who kind of lure them into uh, the d different professions or, or work. Um, there's also illegal, you know, sometimes they come in illegally and so forth. Uh, so it's not necessarily that 
actually it's typically not that it's it's all just based in one country um, or that the networks are, are run by people in one country. So it's a really transnational it's, phenomenon. It's pretty transnational, and it's different. You know, you originally started talking about uh, Myanmar, which is on the western side, the other side of, of Thailand, and that's a, that's also that's a different network and a different phenomenon. Actually, um, uh, the trafficking of persons that that has occurred there recently. Or so from there. So, mm -hmm. so uh, b before I interrupted you, you were talking about so, so the, the, the women, the girls who become effectively victims of, of, of trafficking. I mean, are, are, are these for the most part uh, uh, females from poor families? Are they, are they, are they political refugees? Is it, I mean, it's who, is, is there a particular type that's more susceptible to, to, to being trafficked or become a victim of trafficking? Mm -hmm. So there are, yeah, coming from the east, you know, the, the countries to the east of Thailand, Laos and Cambodia, yeah, they are, they tend to be people who are poorer um, and they're, again, trying to support themselves and their families. And so uh, there have been some cases recently, in the recent years, about domestic workers, people who, you know, housemaids, live-in housemaids uh, working in Southeast Asia who've been, uh, uh, you know, treated very, very badly, you know, badly abused by by their, their employers. And this is, you know, throughout the region, not just in Thailand. So, you know, there are, in, in general, there are more restrictive policies uh, on the side of the home country for for women to get exit visas or be able to you know get leave their countries because they want ostensibly to protect the women um, and in particular for domestic work I mean for a couple of years ago Indonesia because of one of these instances where a domestic worker was severely abused by her by her employers um, Indonesia completely uh, froze froze any any permits to allow people to work to leave the country to work in that capacity so but the problem is the push factor you know the the, the lack of, of opportunities for a, a decent livelihood it is is a problem still and so people still need to seek uh, means of, of, of survival mm -hmm. for themselves and their family so they will go through illegal channels if that's the only way to 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 find employment and, and that makes the them vulnerable yeah. because there are these laws that are supposed to protect women and girls from the, the, this vulnerability but we don't that's where the development issue is related you know we don't have that on the other side you know development that provides them with enough opportunities to stay home and and not become victimized okay so they're more likely to go out and and become you know through these irregular or illegal channels okay okay so 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 I mean this is this is I mean really really fascinating and and so basically no one really knows what they're getting into is that is yeah that Typically, they don't know what they're getting into. And so a couple of the organizations I visited, um, you know, they've been working for on, on this issue within Thailand uh, for, for decades. And, and, you know, the issue, unfortunately, is ongoing because of the, you know, the issues with uh, lack of opportunity back at home. So, you know, I'll talk a bit about this. You know, I know we're taking a break at the moment, but, yeah. That's great. That's very good. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much, Grace. Okay, well... Uh, uh, please, uh, we'll, we'll be back in, in a minute or so. Please stay with us. Uh, fascinating conversation with, with Professor Cheng. We'll be, we'll, be, we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Michael North, inviting you to join us on The Art of Thinking Smart every second Thursday at 12 noon here at the beautiful ThinkTech studios in downtown Honolulu. I'm guest hosting for David Chang of Wellsbridge. Now, we're talking to Hawaii's most intelligent, accomplished leaders about what makes them successful in their professional lives. By absorbing their practical wisdom, all of us can think ahead, think deeper, and become more successful ourselves. We look forward to seeing you on The Art of Thinking Smart. Hello, my name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced attitude in life. Join me.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Thank you for, for, for sticking around. It's much appreciated. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here with, with Professor Grace Chang, uh, who's been doing uh, very, very interesting work in the area of, 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 of human trafficking, uh, particularly the trafficking of women and girls in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, Grace, so, so before break, we were, we were kind of discussing this, this whole idea of, of whether people are, like, know what they're getting into. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so often they don't. I mean, people don't want to be trafficking victims. They don't want to live under uh, coercion and, and be abused and have be extremely vulnerable because they're, they're, you know, they're under somebody else's control. Um, so what the organizations that, that in, in Thailand that I had met with, they've been, that have been working on this issue for, for decades, they've been undertaking uh, a lot of you know, interesting co collaborations with, for example, with the border police, you know, training them, uh, providing them with kind of all the, all the knowledge they've, they've collected over the years. Like very often, yeah, they, these people don't know what kinds of employment they're going into. And so basically they've, for example, set up a, a database of like what are some places where there is legitimate employment, like, like to help the, the officers kind of train, train them to, to, to detect whether they're, they're the address they've been provided is a false one, you know, or, or one that's not an, a place of employment because often that's, that's, where they're vulnerable. They're going to show up at someone's house or something, is not it, really a restaurant. Is there a way of recognizing a victim of human trafficking? You know, I mean, I mean the problem being what it is, right? I mean, if, if I'm going through Thailand and, and, mm -hmm. and I mean, and I, I want to help, or uh, is there, is there, or, or is, is that, is that why it's a problem? Because it's ultimately impossible to. Well, so one of the things is that th these organizations have been pretty successful. You know, there are a lot of them. They work, they've been around for decades, and they, they've coordinated well, and they're working now much more closely with state agencies. Um, the new, uh, the, the current, I think recently appointed Minister of Tourism and Sports of Thailand for the first time is a woman, and she's, you know, been very firm about she wants to crack down on this kind of, okay. you know, uh, illegal, especially commercial, commercial sex industry uh, of which there are many trafficking victims involved although not exclusively so, so so but the thing is yeah like now a lot of for example this commercial sex industry has gone online so you have to join like a line group uh, they don't they're no longer physically like in in bars or in you know these these physical locations so you, you make your appointments online or you have to join the line group yeah it's quite secretive and then you know they they'll they'll give you a, a time and a place where you meet up so so it's a lot it's a bit harder to detect so the traffickers or, or the exploiters of the tra trafficking victims have, have found new ways to avert uh, so process. you know, you bring up the sex industry. I think for a lot of Westerners of Americans, when we, I think, Thailand sex industry trafficking. But but I'm, I'm assuming trafficked women and girls are not are not exclusively co-opted by the sex industry. You were talking about domestic servants earlier, domestic mm -hmm. help. Are there other areas where 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 we find mm -hmm. trafficked individuals? Yeah, yeah, in co yeah. In in domestic help, for example, um, and there are a lot of pushful factors uh, there. Um, there's also in in like uh, agriculture in, in oh, really? plantations, is right? That right? Yeah. Really, um, in the fishing in fishing industry, oh, which uh, is big in Thailand, which right? is big yeah, in yeah, Thailand. Yeah. There was a big, you know, there was a big scandal in 2015, and this was largely the uh, Rohingya minority coming fleeing the Rakhine state in Myanmar because of persecution uh, by them uh, against them. Uh, by the 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 Buddhist majority, and and so they were being they were. Tr afraid for their lives and, and being, you know, very happy to, to be smuggled out and leave, but, but they, didn't, they didn't know, like the other trafficking victims, that they were going to be trafficked into working, you know, to in the fishing, in the industry. fishing industry or, yeah. in Because yeah, we had a case of that in Hawaii, I think, a, a, a few Indonesian individuals, but, but this, this is on a much wider wider scale it would seem at that time and uh, up until that that case was kind of opened up um, yeah because you know in 2000 well you know it goes back a little bit further there were a series of pogroms against the Rohingya which are a, a Muslim minority so in Myanmar can you tell us who the Rohingya we, we hear a lot about the Rohingya so so who are they 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 live in the many of them live in the Rakhine state which is in western Myanmar uh, and and they are a, a, a Muslim 
group and minority, a minority in a Buddhist country. In a Buddhist country, and so in the um, you know in the eighties, early eighties, there were a series of pogroms uh, against them. Anti-Buddhist and no anti-Muslim uh, uh, by, by Buddhists perpetrated by the majority. Yeah. So Buddhist. so much for Buddhism being the world's most peaceful religion. There's there's. I mean, there's it's <laughs> people. Yeah. Exactly. People are violent or people are, are, are peaceful. Religions are, n you know, they're not animate <laughs> beings that can think. So, yeah, I mean, these, these recently, uh, th this issue has become a, a big problem, especially after 2012. A lot of erupt uh, violence erupted in Rakhine State, as well as elsewhere in Myanmar against uh, Muslim minority communities. But in particular in Rakhine State, um, there were, because they're right along the coast, a lot of them start fleeing by sea. And so, you know, trying to come down to, to especially uh, other Muslim majority countries, Malaysia in particular. And um, sometimes they're intercepted uh, and, or they are, you know, because they're desperate to leave, they're, they're kind of easily trafficked uh, by the, these people in the fishing industry. So this is men, this is men and women, a large number of men in this case as well, but women are also put in, in put to work. Have you, through, through, through your work, have you, have you met Rohingyas? Have you had a chance to interact with, with, with? There's a, there's a, s a small group of Rohingya in Thailand who've been there for, for decades. Um, cause I, cause I said, you know, the pogroms against them began in the early eighties and some of them left. Uh, also many of them from that time uh, in Malaysia as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, since the 2012 violence, uh, there's been a, a number that have, have become stranded there. So uh, after 2015, what happened was a series of, of uh, mass graves were discovered in Thailand and in Malaysia. Basically, they were victims of this trafficking and it was a cover-up. Um, so at that time, that, you know, it was quite a big scandal on the international level. So um, there was a much more earnest uh, effort to, to, to prevent the smuggling of, of Rohingya via the sea. And so that no longer takes place. If you see in the news, a lot of them are fleeing to Bangladesh, which is a problem uh, for them because, you know. I mean, yeah. what wasn't there, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, the, the darling, you know, uh, uh, of, of, of the West, has been, has been effectively uh, in, in, in charge in Burma. Uh, you would think that the Rohingya issue would have been settled, but it, it doesn't seem to be the case. It, if anything, it seems things have gotten worse. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with the, yeah, the lack of international attention. More recently, we've seen that. We've seen uh, Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama speak up about this because it's become, you know, it, it's become very obvious that, you know, what's going on there in Rakhine State is tantamount to genocide uh, by some, uh, by some accounts. And um, it's, it's a very troubling situation as far as what the reports we're getting out of there. Um, so now there's more international pressure. But I think, you know, for a while we did have a lot, you know, the Western world in particular were very hopeful about the prospects of democratization, especially under Aung San Suu Kyi's Everything leadership. was supposed to change. I mean, it, it was and supposed to be so much better for everyone. And it it's not so simple because a lot of the other issues in Thailand are kind of tied to that. Not, you know, so in, in uh, my research, I was looking at uh, migration broadly and, you know, looking at the refugee camps that have existed in northern Thailand, uh, refugees coming from the, the, the ethnic conflicts in, in eastern Myanmar from K uh, Kachin, Karen, and Shan states. Uh, there, you know, the international community, because there's a democratization process going on, ostensibly in Myanmar, they think that the refugees can go back home now. But, you know, in fact, there's a lot of, you know, international investment going on in the regions where people have been displaced in those zones. Um, also, there's not a lot of good coordination so that people feel confident about going back, especially if they've been displaced for decades. Yeah. So, so there's a lot, you know, there's a withdrawal of support for, for services uh, that those, the people living in the refugee camps uh, depend on. And, and, you know, I think that the, the democratization process deserves a little more critical view uh, as far as, as really, you know, how people, regular people are experiencing, not just, you know, not just in the minority areas, but, you know, this was another thing that uh, was, you know, I had available to me is meeting many scholars of Myanmar from Myanmar talking about the situation in the country. Um, you know, we do need to look at it more critically and not just, you know, take, uh, have, have this, 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 I guess, 
what do you call it, personal, this great personality of Aung San Suu Kyi uh, kind of uh, let make us lazy about interrogating it more closely and, and following how, yeah, how does this opening up process really uh, been unfolding and, and what are the problem areas? And Rakhine State, the Rohingya, that is a major one that hopefully the international community can continue to, to uh, urge and pressure uh, the Myanmar government to, to address. So, so, Grace, I mean, you know, you, you, you're looking at this carefully. You've been doing this for a while. Are you optimistic about the future? Is, do you see improvements being made? Are things going from bad to worse? I mean, what's, you know, what's the, what, what's the future of human trafficking? I mean, do we, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. in, in the sense that is, is this an industry that's going to keep growing? Or are the efforts being undertaken really limiting and damaging? Um, I know it's a tough question, but just, <laughs> to, you know, you talk, cause, I mean, it's interesting, you, you, you talk about the, that kind of the sex trade going online. I mean, that doesn't bode well for efforts to end trafficking if these guys get that creative. I mean, so just general, I know, generally speaking, what's, what's your sense? Well, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the reasons, like we, talk, we started talking about, right, with, uh, behind uh, people's decisions to migrate, whether as refugees or being, seeking employment across borders, or, is, is that the situation back home is, it does not allow them to, to live uh, in a secure way and, and have, be able to, to have hope for their future. And so I think as long as we don't address basic issues of, you know, s development, especially sustainable development, yeah. to make that available for many communities in developing countries where there are people who, who are willing to risk things or who are vulnerable um, to these kinds of opportunities overseas, that's, you know, that's, that's part of the, uh, the, the reason for there being an available, you know, pool of people who, who can be exploited or taken advantage of. So, so, so basically, I mean, as much as, you know, we need to address the symptoms, ultimately we'll have to look at the cause. We'll have to look at underdevelopment. We'll like, we have to look at conflict and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think so. That's, that was, that was, that was great. Thank you very much, Grace. It's fascinating. You should have your own show. Oh, wait, that's <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. It's been, it's been, it's been a great honor to, to do this. Thanks for, for giving me the privilege. It's, it's fantastic to sit in this particular seat. Uh, to, our, to our viewers, thank you very much for, for, for watching the show. And, and Grace will be back uh, next week, I presume. So, so, so thank you very, very much. And, and uh, au revoir tout le monde. Merci beaucoup.